Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bruce Baer. I'm Dean of the College of Forest Resources, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the 16th Denman Forest Reissues Series entitled Bioenergy and Biofuels in Washington. I, I look forward to this session this afternoon, as I hope all of you do, as it's a very timely set of topics that we're going to hear about today. Basically, the theme will be how do we convert the agricultural, the forest, and the municipal waste biomass into a variety of bioproducts. This subject is in keeping with the purpose of the Denman Forestry Issue Series, which is to provide information and discussion on timely forestry and natural resource issues. And as with all activities associated with an academic setting, our ultimate goal is to inform and educate our students, our faculty and staff, as well as resource professionals, citizens group, landowners, and the general public. These programs are made possible through the generous support provided by the Denman Endowment for Student Excellence in Forest Resources, and they support the college's vision of world-class and international recognition as a source of knowledge relevant to environmental and natural resource issues. Before I go any further, I would also like to acknowledge two people who have helped put this program together. First, Ellen Matheny, Educational Outreach Specialist with the University of Washington's Olympic Natural Resources Center in Forks, who basically took care of all the arrangements for this session today. And secondly, Bob Edmonds, our Associate Dean in the College of Forest, Resor of Forest Resources, who uh, organized the program. The mission of the College of Forest Resources is to study and investigate the functionality and the sustainability of natural resource systems in both natural and managed, and managed environments using an interdisciplinary approach across multiple spatial and temporal scales to include our urban, suburban, and wildland landscapes. In our college, we focus on programs in sustainable forestry, sustainable urban ecosystems, and sustainable forest enterprises. Sustainability serves as the goal for all of our programs and includes all resources such as timber, plants, water, wildlife, or insects, for example, considers the needs of future generations as well as those of the present, and strives for a dynamic equilibrium that balances ecological functions and conditions with social and economic factors. Today, we wish to focus on a variety of issues related to the conversion of biomass to bioenergy, biofuels, or other bioproducts here in Washington State. And we believe that this theme does, in fact, reinforce the college's theme of sustainability. There's many types of biofuels that you'll hear about. I'm just going to list a couple. One is biogas, sometimes called swamp gas, landfill gas, or digester gas, produced under anaerobic conditions from organic waste and is composed of methane and carbon dioxide. A second is bioethanol, produced by fermentation from a variety of crops, typically sugarcane, corn, sugar beets, potatoes, and many others. And then there's additional biofuels, such as cellulosic bioethanol, which is made from lignocellulose, which would be materials such as corn stover, wood chips, switchgrass, wheat straw, etc., using one of two processes, either a biological approach, cellulosis, or a thermochemical approach, gasification or pyrolysis. And then there's many others, biodiesel, bio-oil, butanol, biomethanol, propanol, and many others. Why are we interested in bioenergy and biofuels? Well, there's many reasons. In forestry, one of the big reasons is we wish to use a lot of our small trees uh, found throughout our forest in North America to improve the health of our forest. Oftentimes, these small trees uh, are clogging up the forest, causing many uh, disease and insect outbreak problems. If we could find markets for these small trees in biofuels or bioenergy outlets, it would greatly 
aid uh, the improvement of our forest health. The second reason we're interested is to reduce the geopolitical reliance on fossil fuels and increase energy security. A third is that the use of these fuels is more carbon neutral than fossil fuels, as shown by many life cycle analyses, and it helps reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And lastly, uh, we want to use biofuels, and, uh, uh, produce biofuels and bioenergy to help increase rural development opportunities. Our theme is bioenergy and biofuels in Washington, and it's my pleasure to introduce your moderator from the University of Washington College of Forest Resources, Professor Kevin Hodson. Kevin? Thank you very much, Bruce, and welcome to all of you today to this uh, Denman Forestry Issue Series. It's my pleasure again uh, to be your moderator today. Okay, our final session is entitled Biomass Processing for Bioenergy and Biofuels. Uh, the first speaker for the last section is uh, Professor Shulin Chen. He's from Washington State uh, University, where he's director of the WSU Center for Bioproducts and Bioenergy. He is in the Department of Biological Systems Engineering and has BS and MS degrees in Ag Engineering and a PhD in Biological and Environmental Engineering from uh, Cornell University back in New York. And Dr. Chen's research interests are industrial biosystems engineering with applications in biofuel, biochemicals, and biogas production. Uh, the title of his talk today here is Fungal-Based On-Site Enzyme Production for Cellulosic Biomass Processing. I'm going to, in my presentation, highlight a research initiative that hopefully will give you some idea about the research efforts that we're making in the university on converting the Washington biomass into biofuel and bioenergy. The national goal is by 2000, 2030, we're going to produce 60 billion gallons of ethanol. So if you translate that into very practical terms, for, to produce an amount of ethanol, we need to have 600 ethanol plants, each producing 100 million gallons per year. 600, okay? What's our share, Washington State? Are we going to get a 10, 15? You can see, the uh, majority of the material for those plants have to come from lignocellulosic material based on our previous speakers. Okay. Unfortunately, right now, there is no such a plant exist anywhere in the world. Okay. It takes a lot of effort for, from all of us to make it happen. In order to use the wood material or crop residues to produce ethanol, we have to break down the biopolymer, which is cellulose and the hemicellulose, and liberate the sugar. That's the single unit of the biopolymer so that we can use that sugar to, be, to, to permit, uh, ferment, produce ethanol. So this process in a biological conversion platform will be accomplished by enzyme. Enzymes are produced by microbial. Of course, the fermentation from sugar to ethanol will be done also by uh, microbial. The problem is not, uh, not, not the technology, okay? The technology, the possibility is there. Now we can produce ethanol from lignocellulosic material. We can do that technically, but not economically. Okay? So the main challenge is how we can make it economically, make the bar refinery viable. So if you look at the cost of ethanol production from lignocellulosic material, for simple term, in simple term, we can divide into three parts. The first part is enzyme. The second part is the processes. The third part is the feedstock. So the president goal set when he talked 2002, that this line. 
So we need to accomplish this line so that we can make sure that uh, lignocellulosic ethanol become competitive in 2012, com competitive with the uh, corn ethanol. So long way to go. Now, from the research perspective, that's our job. Our job is to try to find ways to reduce the columns so that each one becomes smaller. What we do at WSU, we're working on, in our department, by the way, we're working on the first two, the enzyme production and the process cost. So the approach that we're taking, is this is just one example again, is to produce the enzyme on site. Yeah? You think enzyme is very expensive. Why is it expensive? Because all the production relate to enzyme. If we can produce this enzyme on site, then we can reduce the cost of that enzyme. And also, if we do it right, we can produce the enzyme in a way so that it also help the pretreatment. So that's the approach we're taking. Why we select on site enzyme production? Because all benefit associated with it. First, we don't want to purify the enzyme. We'll produce on site, we use it right away. No purification, reduce the cost. No transportation, because we produce the enzyme at the plant. So we don't have to transport the enzyme to, to the plant. And we utilize the low cost medium. I can show you what medium that we use. And we can also ca customize the enzyme production for specific feedstock or mixed feedstock. And the other thing we need to think about is how do we save water and other resources in the, the entire processes. So the technology that we're developing, it's not only idea. We have several major components. First one, we want to co-culture the fungus. It's a fungal-based. Different fungal species let them to grow together. Secondly, we develop a technology in our lab so that we can palletize the fungus let them grow as an aggregate in an ideal form so that they increase the biomass to in improve the productivity. And also, again, we want to use the local, uh, locally available, low-cost medium. And we want to employ improved strengths, find the good bugs to do the job. And certainly, we can optimize the media composition so that to, to produce the, the enzyme we want. And then we can control the inducing factor and other environment factors. The, enz the, the enzymes are produced only under certain conditions. The fungus, you can grow like a crazy, but they don't produce enzyme. You have to in induce the production of an enzyme. And other environment factors you have to control. Now, I just want to give you some examples. Each data point represents a lot of hard work, okay? This is a, this example. For ideal enzyme, you want a mixture between total cellulase and the beta glucosidase. Those are two types of enzyme. Now, we have two microorganisms, one called the uh, trichoderma rhesii, which is very popular fungus used for cellulase production. This enzyme, Okay, this is this one, right? It produces a lot of cellulose, some other type of cellulose, total cellulose, but very little <coughs> beta glucosidase. And the other fungus, this Aspidulus pharmacist, just upset. It produces, this is produce very little cellulose, but a lot of beta glucosidase. You know what we do? We put them together. When you put them together, they grow and grow, uh, produce an enzyme like this. Now you have uh, what a desired level of uh, beta glucosidase and also have desired level of cellulase. So that's ideal, right? You know what we did? We grow them on manure. Okay. Manure is not a good thing, right? From the general public uh, perception. However, to the fungus, they're ideal. Okay, look how the nutrients, <laughs> look how the nutrients in the in the in the in the manure. It's just a dairy manure. Yeah, so we did that. 
Again, the, uh, the other challenge in, in, the, in the enzyme production is you have to control the morphology of the fungus. Okay? If you let the fungus grow in manure, they grow like this, like crazy, like a cotton shape. But we have to make them grow like this, small pellets, so that to be more efficient. So in our lab, we invented a procedure that can be reliably convert the morphology from this to that. Once we make that conversion, we can put a lot of uh, bomb mass into the reactor, produce very quickly. And this is what we applied this technology to white rot fungus. You know, white rot fungus can produce lignanase, which, which break down the lignin, right? So that it help to liberate the sugar from cellulose and the hemicellulose. If we grow this uh, uh, white rot fungus uh, as a mat, no enzyme activity. Does not, it does not produce enzyme. But we grow them as a pellet, then we see enzyme activity. So that palletization technology helped produce, make it possible. And the other thing is, we also want to grow this in manure. It turns out we tried a different type of manure, and a certain manure composition, you see high enzyme activity. And then we look at the manure composition, it uh, makes sense, because every, every time it have enzyme activity, it has to have something that the fungus lack. What pleases us more is that in, in addition to the in, enzyme activity, the fungus also turn the fiber in the manure into sugar. Okay, this surprised us. We thought the white rod fungus you know, primarily produce lignanase, right? Then we found lots of high sugar concentration. We start with the manure does not have any sugar. Shouldn't, right? The cow doesn't have uh, any disease, then the, um, the, uh, the manure shouldn't have any sugar in there. So we have raw manure to put in and we end up lots of sugar. All we did is inoculate the manure, use the fungus that we produce, I mean, not we produce, we, we used. So the other component of our research is finding new microorganisms. This is the new fungus that we found. Okay? Turns out this fungus works better than the white rod fungus that we used earlier. It's very exciting. Um, Again, what I talked to you is just one example of research activity in our lab because we have, you know, you have lots of expectation to the public university, state, state university to deliver or improve the technology so that we can, or we can deploy in future for biorefinery. So we're doing everything we can to do the, uh, uh, research and development and make progress in science and technology. And the other related work, for example, we're also uh, conducting assessment of different technology for utilization of Washington biomass. And also in this, uh, you know, research group, we're developing a distributed uh, cellulose ethanol production system using the world's feedstock. We all recognize that we don't have the corn store as the Midwest, right? So our system has to be different from the Midwest. This, this is what we call distributed system use uh, diverse feedstock. Are we accomplished that yet? Are we successful yet? The answer is no, but we're working on it. Um, then the third area we work on is biological enhanced pretreatment. You, you know we have to break help the, uh, the deliver, uh, liberate the sugar by break down, do some pretreatment uh, to the wood material or straws. In the current the chemical and uh, uh, physical process, we want to do that with more of a biological process. And the, the, the other area we're working on is thermophile-based consolidated bioprocessing. And also we work on mathematical models for processing integration and optimization. We believe in digital biorefinery. Before we make a biorefinery, we design it on computer, work out everything, and then design it, then, uh, then actually build it. With that, I thank you for your attention. Uh, our next speaker in this session is uh, another colleague of mine, Professor Renata Bura, who just joined us uh, about a year ago 
after completing a PhD uh, from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. She will give us a talk on the bioconversion of lignocellulosic biomass to ethanol. So today, um, during my talk, actually, I will discuss in smaller or bigger details how actually we convert this lignocellulosic biomass to ethanol. So uh, have your pencils ready, and this is going to be a basically a cooking class. How actually do we do it? Um, so in order to explain this very sophisticated process, I use this very simple cartoon. It always works. So here we have a bio, pile of biomass. And as my previous, previous speakers actually mentioned, biomass is composed of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. So first we have to separate the main components of biomass. And we do this during our pretreatment process. And uh, the pretreatment process which we use in the lab, it's a little bit more sophisticated than as you can see here on this actually uh, cartoon. And we use, during our pretreatment, high temperature and high pressure to separate the main components. After pretreatment, we have to break down the huge polymer of cellulose into smaller components, such as glucose. And we do this during hydrolysis. And we use cellulosic enzymes to actually do this process for us. One of the co-products during bioconversion process is lignin. And we can use lignin actually. Um, we actually burning this lignin and we can actually generate in this actually system heat for our future biorefinery. As soon as we get this monomeric sugars, we can actually use our good friend, baker's yeast or brewer's yeast, to actually ferment our monomeric sugars to ethanol. And at the end of the process, we are extremely happy to get ethanol. Sometimes my students are a little bit extra happy. I don't know why. And uh, one of the co-products is actually carbon dioxide. And we can use this co-products, co-product actually for a uh, soft drink industry. And again, after distillation, we can use this ethanol to fuel our vehicles. So this is bio uh, conversion 101. Right now, I'd like to go into a little bit more details. So first, like I mentioned to you before, we have to use biomass to separate different components of biomass. And after pretreatment, we have a liquid phase, which is mostly composed of hemicellulose. And we have a solid phase, which is mostly composed of lignin and cellulose. So what does pretreatment do? First of all, like I mentioned to you before, it helps us in the separation of main components of biomass, hemicellulose, cellulose, and lignin. Also increases available surface area, reduces the particle size. And ideally, if we are smart about our pretreatment, it solubilizes our hemicellulose and increases enzymatic digestibility of cellulose. By the way, the pretreatment is actually the most important part of biomass to ethanol conversion. One of the typical pretreatments which we use uh, is steam explosion. Steam explosion works well with agricultural biomass, hardwood biomass, and softwood biomass. Uh, what's a steam explosion? Well, it's a treatment of biomass with high pressure steam for a short period of time, and we have, at the end of the treatment, we have a sudden decompression. There, we can hear the explosion part. By the way, it's very safe. Uh, during the steam explosion, we actually use um, sulfur dioxide sometimes or sulfuric acid to impregnate our biomass in order to increase steam explosion efficiency. What are the typical conditions? No, you cannot use your microwave. You have to use temperature between 170 to 250 degrees Celsius and time between 10, to, uh, 10 seconds to 10 minutes. And again, the conditions will depend on what kind of biomass you're dealing with. And I'll cover this in the future slides. So how, does it, how, how, how actually does it look like? Um, steam pretreatment um, system. Again, you cannot use this in your own backyard. You have to you have a special lab or a future biorefinery. So here we have a picture of two liter steam gun. And steam gun has a fill valve, steam valve, and blow valve. At the end of uh, steam explosion, the pretreated biomass is actually being received here in the receiving vessel. And here we have a picture of the pretreated cone stover after steam explosion. So the next exciting part, OK, we separate the, our hemicellulose from cellulose and lignin. And right now, we have to deal with long, this long polymer of cellulose. We have to break down this long polymer into glucose units. So we use our enzymes. And we heard about good things about enzymes uh, from the previous speakers. Speaker, actually. Um, during this process, we use cellulases. 
they're produced by um, bacteria or funguses, and they catalyze the depolymerization of cellulose, and we have three types of cellulases. Endoglucanases, they work actually in the middle of the chain. Exoglucanases, they work on the end of chain. And beta-glucosidases, they actually break down cellobios into glucose. And how does it look like? Well, you see the magic in a few seconds. So we have right now stack of long chain of cellulose in the pre-treated lignocellulosic biomass. So, okay, we, I mentioned to you before we have three types of enzymes. So the first one is endoglucanases. And they actually break down the cellulose in the middle of the uh, chain. Here we have another endoglucanase. does exactly the same job. And everything happens in a catalytic site. And then we, here we have another type of enzyme which is actually responsible for um, depolymerization of cellulose, exoglucanase. Think about a dinosaur. This dinosaur actually has a, a linkage here, catalytic domain, and actually this part is responsible for attaching itself um, to cellulose chain. As, as you can see from this movie, Again, something is happening. You can see, um, you know, the lights are on and off. So it means this cellulose is being um, digested more and more and more and all, more. And here we have, you see another um, dinosaur doing exactly the same uh, job. It's being actually very active right now. As you can see, this uh, linker is moving constantly and binding domain is just going after this cellulose like there is no tomorrow. And then again, this is an active process. You see the lights are uh, flashing. And at the end of this process, okay, come on, we have a formation of cellobios, so two glucose units together. And we have a third enzyme, beta-glucosidase. And beta-glucosidase is going to come right now and cliff this cellobios into two glucose units. And actually, cellulose is ready for fermentation process. Okay, so fermentation. This is the last part of the process, and during fermentation, we use uh, our good friend, baker's yeast or brewer's yeast, um, scientifically known as Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And this actually yeast has been selected for over thousands of years, so we, were, we know this yeast quite well. It has a high ethanol yield and productivity, and it's relatively too sim simple to culture. We can do it at home. I can do it, you can do it too. So at the end of the fermentation, from glucose, we can get ethanol and carbon dioxide. So right now, we know how it works. Everybody can tell me about pretreatment, hydrolysis, and fermentation. And I, right now, I'd like to talk a, a little bit about what we do um, at UDAP, at the University of Washington, in College of Forest Resources, in terms of converting these different types of biomass to ethanol. So I'll concentrate on pretreatment, although we do research in hydrolysis and fermentation. Why pretreatment again? Pretreatment is one of the most important steps in biomass to ethanol conversion. So at the College of Forest Resources, we have expertise in converting agricultural residues, corn stover, corn fiber, rice straw, rice straw, wheat straw. Currently, we're working on converting giant reed, reed or switchgrass or sugarcane bagasse. And these two projects are sponsored by Weyerhaeuser and Novozymes. We also have a great expertise in converting hardwood uh, biomass, for example, hyperpopular um, to ethanol with and without bark. We're also working on conversion of mixed biomass to ethanol, paper waste, and recently we got actually a new grant to convert municipal solid waste to ethanol. I'm not going to say it, but we know how to convert lots of types of biomass to ethanol, as you can see. Um, during the conversion process of any kind of biomass, the most important part is to actually, how do we do it? What kind of temperature, what kind of pressure do we use? How actually do, how we do perform the pretreatment so we won't actually screw up the rest of the sub-processes, such as fermentation and hydrolysis. So that's why we have to optimize our pretreatment condition for every single type of biomass. Um, why? Because by using maybe lower pressure and lower temperature, 
we can get excellent fermentation yield, but our hydrolyzability is gonna suffer. So we're not gonna be able at the end of the day to break down this um, cellulose into glucose. Contrary, contrary, when we use high severity of the pretreatment, we can get very good soil digestibility, but we can get very poor fermentability because we generated lots of inhibitors and our fermentation process is not gonna happen. So every single feedstock has its own optimum pretreatment severity, which is characterized by good fermentation yield and good soil digestibility. Uh, for example, we are able to find this optimal pretreatment uh, conditions for corn fiber, corn stover, uh, mixture of corn fiber, stover and poplar, poplar or lodge pine. As you can see, for agricultural residues, we don't have to use so much power to break down agricultural um, residues to ethanol. However, for hardwood and softwood residues, we have to use a little bit higher pressure temperature in order to separate the main components of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. So what's actually, at the end of this talk, somebody might ask me a question. So if I have a one kilogram of biomass, how much ethanol do I get at, at the end of the day? One mil, five mils? For example, uh, if we use lodge pine, if we have one kilogram of lodge pine, and if in the lab, we use steam pretreatment and hydrolysis and fermentation. At the end of the day, we can convert 80% of the sugars to ethanol. And if you want to do a little calculation, from one kilogram of pine, we can get around 250 mils of ethanol. In conclusion, as you can see, uh, converting lignocellulosic biomass to ethanol is quite easy. I wouldn't go that far. It's not that easy. Um, I just made it easy. Uh, we use pretreatment, hydrolysis, and fermentation. So I'll be happy if you, after this talk, we remember that in order to convert the biomass to ethanol, we have to use three processes, pretreatment, hydrolysis, and fermentation. And also, um, here at the college, we can actually use any type of lignocellulosic biomass, and we can convert this lignocellulosic biomass to bioethanol. And currently, we're also working at the conversion different type of lignocellulosic biomass um, into uh, other biofuels and chemicals. Thank you. Our uh, next speaker is uh, also from the College of Forest Resources here at the UW, Professor Sharon Doty. Uh, she's assistant professor here, uh, a geneticist uh, and uh, a microbiologist with degrees from uh, Cal Davis and here at the UW. You She's going to give a, a talk today called, entitled uh, Enhancing the Efficiency of Biofuel Production Using Endophytic Mitro Microorganisms. Um, so I'm going to be talking about enhancing the efficiency of biofuel production using uh, microorganisms that live inside of plants. Uh, some of the bioenergy um, problems that have been brought up recently in uh, these talks are that uh, even if we used all of our corn and all of our soybean exclusively for bioenergy instead of for food, uh, it still wouldn't satisfy our energy requirements. And so um, uh, we really need to focus our attention away from these things to um, eat our food instead of burn our food. Um, uh, also, there's a great deal of waste in transporting the feedstocks. It really is making no sense that we're importing corn from the Midwest to the Puget Sound area so that we could make ethanol. Um, so uh, in order to, to switch over to this uh, lignocellulosic ethanol production that has been discussed so much today, uh, we really need to be able to increase the efficiency of this process. So two of the uh, methods I'm going to discuss today are um, one, to try to grow plants, um, uh, bioenergy crops at lower cost and the second is to use yeast strains that are adapted to the sugars that are in plants. So the focus of my research is on uh, poplar and willow. These um, grow um, in uh, many different regions, as has been uh, discussed earlier. Uh, they're, uh, um, because they're not annual crops, then um, they uh, utilize the uh, resources more efficiently. You can um, grow them for several years and it's not such an intensive crop such as uh, corn. Populus trichocarpa is our uh, native black cottonwood 
And um, the Salix syngensis here is our uh, native willow. Uh, so they both belong to the same family. There are about 450 species of willow worldwide, uh, 106 of these in North America. So there is a great deal of genetic diversity. They can colonize nutrient-poor sites. They don't need to be taking up our prime agricultural land. Um, they have an extensive root system. Uh, they have high wildlife value. So in the time when um, they're not going to be used for um, bioenergy, they can be a uh, nesting ground for uh, birds. Uh, they grow very quickly. In just two years, they're already three to four meters tall. And uh, it's been noted that willows are the least expensive woody plants to grow. So for all of these reasons, they make excellent candidates for bioenergy crops. So um, first I'll talk about reducing the cost of growing these bioenergy crops. Um, one of the major costs of growing these crops is uh, the cost of chemical fertilizers. Uh, chemical fertilizers are synthesized, um, uh, made by this process, which is, uh, takes a great deal of energy to produce these uh, chemical fertilizers. Um, and we use an amazing amount of them. So this chart shows the world fertilizer use. This is the year, and this is uh, nitrogen in a million metric tons. You can see that our, our demand for chemical fertilizers has been steadily increasing. Um, this production requires um, petroleum. It, it's a very high, high energy requiring process. So if we can diminish the use of these chemical fertilizers, we can decrease the costs of producing the bioenergy crops. So this can be done biologically instead of um, chemically. So using uh, microbes that can fix atmospheric nitrogen. So our atmosphere is 80% dinitrogen gas but only certain microbes are able to utilize this nitrogen gas and convert it to a form that's usable. Uh, this is the enzymatic reaction for nitrogen fixation that uh, only some microbes have. Uh, it's an energy intensive process biologically, and so it's usually uh, coupled with a plant. So these microbes tend to hang out with plants. The plants are photosynthesizing, and they produce a great deal of extra sugars that they transport into the um, zone where the bacteria are. And then um, the bacteria are fed, and then in return, they can um, produce this usable uh, nitrogen form, the ammonia. So my research focuses on endophytes. These are microorganisms that live inside of plants without causing disease. They've been shown to have all sorts of benefits to the plant, including uh, increased nutrient acquisition, which includes the nitrogen fixation. They can help plants resist pathogens, and uh, remarkably, they, they help the plant to resist all sorts of stresses, including um, salt and heat and cold. So some of these endophytes can fix nitrogen. Uh, so nitrogen fixation is not just by rhizobium or frankia in root nodules, which was, has uh, long been thought to be the, the only way that this is occurring. Uh, this is an alder tree, and it has uh, root nodules um, containing frankia. Um, but recent, just in the last uh, 10 years or so, uh, research has shown that um, microbes can live inside of plants and fix nitrogen there. And one of the best examples is the sugarcane endophytes. Uh, these were found to provide a significant amount of nitrogen for the plant. Uh, there are also uh, microbes that were found in sweet potato plants uh, that can fix nitrogen for those plants. So in my research, I, I've been studying um, poplar and willow, and I found that um, poplar and willow contain these nitrogen-fixing endophytes as well. So in wild settings, poplar and willow can grow under very low nitrogen conditions. Uh, this is the Snoqualmie River in western Washington. And as you can see, the poplar and willow are growing in nothing but rocks. There is no organic material there at all. So I looked inside of the, the stems of these poplar and willow, and I found uh, quite a collection of these microbes that can fix nitrogen. Uh, the, these are not in any sort of root nodules, like, uh, like with legumes. 
Now these are just um, growing within the stem. So this is a growth curve showing, um, this is time and um, optical density showing the, the growth of the microbes. And you can see that uh, many of these strains that I isolated from poplar and willow grow remarkably well in medium without any ammonium or nitrate. In other words, they're getting their nitrogen from the air. So my idea is that ultimately we can use biological nitrogen fixation instead of chemical fertilizers to grow these bioenergy crops. So my second part of my talk is on uh, using more efficient yeast strains to increase the efficiency of biofuel production. Um, this is in um, two components. Uh, one thing that hasn't been brought up yet today is that uh, the baker's yeast that uh, is normally used focuses only on six carbon sugars. And so uh, yeast that could use both five carbon and six carbon sugars would be a great benefit. And also uh, yeast that are tolerant to the chemicals that are released during this processing, those inhibitors that Renata Bira mentioned, um, would also be helpful. So, um, so um, poplar trees, for example, contain about 17% uh, xylose. And xylose is a five carbon sugar uh, that uh, the baker's yeast will not even look at. So uh, in my, um, uh, my studies of looking at microbes that live inside of poplar and willow, I found that some of them were yeast strains. And so I was wondering if these yeast strains from poplar might be better for bioethanol production. Uh, this is a, a graph showing, again, um, growth over time. Uh, this is baker's yeast, which is not growing well at all. This is xylose, in the, is the sugar. And xylose, again, is one of those five carbon sugars. So xylose, uh, so baker's yeast doesn't grow well. But one of the yeast strains that I isolated that naturally lives in poplar um, grows quite vigorously in this five carbon sugar. So I think this makes sense if the uh, microbes are living inside of poplar and willow, that they would be adapted to the sugars that are normally present. These uh, poplar yeasts also produce more ethanol from xylose than baker's yeast can. So when um, they're provided 3% xylose, um, baker's yeast produces a small amount, whereas some of these uh, strains that I isolated from poplar uh, all contain um, maybe they produce about three to four times more ethanol. And then the second point are these strains more tolerant to the phytochemicals that are released from plants. So this work um, was done by an undergraduate researcher in my lab. This is uh, just a very simple assay to see if um, when you homogenize plant tissue, um, in this case you just used a blender, when you uh, collect uh, poplar leaves and put them in a blender, uh, it produces a nice uh, green solution, but then it very rapidly turns gray. And so these are all of these phenolic compounds, these um, inhibitors that are, that are being released by the plant cells. Um, then we measured the growth of um, the, the yeast strains from poplar compared to baker's yeast. And you can see here that after about a day, the baker's yeast just dies. It just can't grow anymore in these... Um, uh, phytochemicals that were released by the poplar, whereas the other yeast strains that were from poplar are continuing to grow uninhibited. So the conclusions are that these endophytic microbes can help poplar and willow to grow on nutrient-poor land at very low cost. You could use them instead of, uh, instead of chemical fertilizers. Also, the poplar yeast strains can utilize both 5-carbon and 6-carbon sugars while the conventional strain cannot. And the poplar yeast strains are tolerant to these phytochemicals that are released when the poplar trees are homogenized. Uh, unfortunately, these poplar yeast strains overall cannot compete with the huge amount of um, ethanol that can be produced by um, baker's yeast, because that we've selected over thousands of years for that purpose, so it produces enormous amounts. Um, but the Department of Energy Joint Genome Institute I uh, accepted my nomination to do genomic sequencing of my strains, so hopefully we could transfer some of those traits uh, into 
the brewer's yeast. Okay, thank you. The last speaker in today is uh, Professor Phil Malty, who is from mechanical engineering here at the University of Washington. Uh, Phil has his PhD from University of Michigan, uh, has worked in the technical aspects of combustion for many years. Phil's talk today is biofuels combustion. I've heard today about ethanol, in fact I've heard a lot about ethanol, and I've heard about methanol, and then some about biodiesel. So if this community provides somebody like myself methanol or ethanol, that's a no-brainer. Um, those fuels are quite easy to burn. But if you go to the fuels like biodiesel or something like that, then there are, then there are issues. And it's not as straightforward. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present some information we've pulled out of the literature. A little down-to-earth statement here. If you build a 100 million gallon per year biodiesel refinery, so if I assume that that plant is producing biodiesel with a 0.88 Pacific gravity, that's a pretty nominal Pacific gravity for biodiesel, and if I assume that biodiesel has a lower heating value of 37,200 kilojoules per kilogram, again, pretty nominal, that is energy-wise almost exactly equal to one combined cycle combustion turbine power plant based on the GE uh, uh, frame seven gas turbine engine, which is, a, which is a fairly popular combined cycle power plant. Now here's a case history. This is a paper that was published or presented at, uh, at last May's uh, gas turbine meeting, international gas turbine meeting in Montreal. And it's always, it, it had perplexed people for for quite some time about, about why when you put biodiesel into the diesel engine, the oxide of nitrogen emissions tended to go up a little bit. They didn't go up a lot, but they went up, if you put it on B100, that is 100% biodiesel, and you compared it to petroleum diesel, the emissions tended to go up about 10%. Not a lot, but the question is why? And it has to do with something called the modulus of compressibility, or what's called the, the bulk modulus. And what this does, it affects the way the fuel injector injects the fuel. And it turns out when you switch from, from regular diesel fuel to biodiesel and do nothing else, the fuel injector injects that fuel earlier. And when you inject fuel earlier into a diesel engine, you tend to get more of what's called the first phase or the premixed phase of combustion in a diesel engine. And that leads to a higher oxide of nitrogen emission. Now, if you go on to gas turbines, if you're making your biodiesel using a homogeneous catalyst, that, that catalyst is probably going to go out mainly with, with the glycerin of the, of the glycerol. But you've got to be careful of the fact that maybe some of that potassium and sodium ends up with the fatty acid methyl esters with your biodiesel. If you look at the specs, for the sum of potassium and sodium that are allowed for, that, for, their, for these turbine engines, the Class E and the Class FA, the, the Frame 7 engine, the modern one, is a Class FA engine. And they're saying one part per million by weight at the max for those alkali metals in the fuel. Now, that's not very much. Now, here's some work I want to show you out of the University of California at Irvine. When you're going to burn a liquid fuel such as, such as diesel or biodiesel, you've got two choices on how you're going to burn it. You're going to burn it as traditional spray combustion, basically giving a yellow flame. The yellow color is due to the soot particles burning and giving a, giving, giving a glowing yellow color. Or you're going to try to vaporize it quickly and mix it with air before it reaches the flame, so you've got a blue flame. The folks at UCI were doing traditional yellow flame combustion. So what they did is they compared biodiesel with diesel, took these sprays, and then put them into a, into a small gas turbine combustor. They found that the biodiesel was giving a larger droplet. I quote here, a 20% larger SMD. That means solder mean diameter. And then, uh, then a longer time to evaporate, even, even 
even changing things so you start with the same initial droplet size. So this stuff's taking longer to evaporate. Now, because of those two things, when they compared their emissions from the combustor, they were finding that both oxides of nitrogen and carbon monoxide had higher emissions from their combustor, comparing these two fuels, higher emissions from the biodiesel. So they were somewhat cautious, and they felt it was because the biodiesel spray was giving them a different, a different flame, a poor atomization, a poor, a poor spray quality. So what this indicates to the combustion engineer, there's work to be done. There's R&D to be done. I mean, this, this, this kind of thing can be overcome, but it's going to take some R&D. And you're going to have to, to match the fuel to the atomizer injector, that is to the fuel nozzle, to the combustor. Uh, here's some distillation curves comparing ethanol down at the bottom. Of course, that's got one temperature at which it vaporizes because it's a pure substance. I think 74 degrees Celsius, if I remember right. And then the red curve is the diesel fuel, number two diesel fuel, which is typically what we're burning. And then the top curve, the blue curve, is biodiesel. Now, biodiesel isn't quite single temperature uh, vaporization, but it's coming, it's coming close. Uh, here's a study out of the University of Alabama. Now, they took a different approach in the laboratory. They said, let's, let's use our fuel nozzle with an air assist nozzle. That means that air is mixed into, into the atomization process. So by the time, the time the fuel reaches the flame, it has, been, it has been mixed with air, and so it burns as a blue flame rather than a yellow flame. It essentially burns as a pre-mixed, pre-vaporized flame. These folks ran three fuels. They ran biodiesel, they ran diesel fuel, and they also ran what they call bio-oil, which which some of us call pyrolysis oil. They found that the, that the NOx for the biodiesel was less than the other fuels, and they found that the carbon monoxide was less than the other fuels. So this is encouraging. The message here is that perhaps the way you go with this fuel is you pre-mix it and pre-vaporize it. Um, so the message on this slide is lean pre-mixed combustion. From the previous slide, we saw Lean premise combustion offers the potential for lower emissions in steady flow combustion systems, such as gas turbines, such as furnaces. There's a, there's a company that was just recently established back in Columbia, Maryland, called LPP Combustion Limited Liability Corporation. They go a step further. Their technology takes a liquid fuel, such as biodiesel or such as diesel, converts that fuel in a skid-mounted rig by the furnace or by the engine to a gas. Then that goes into the engine and basically burns as, as natural gas would burn, giving very low emission. Now, our work in, in, in my laboratory is, is focused on, on the following. We are pursuing the lean premix combustion route. And our work is done in fairly high intensity flames, as you would find in gas turbine engines and some of your power generation furnaces. And what I've shown up in the, up in the corner there is one, of our, is one of our combustion reactors, which we call jet stirred reactors. What you see is the outside of it, and you can see the, the, the glow from the combustion that's inside. Um, we're starting a test where we will compare biodiesel with diesel. Uh, what we do in our work is we focus on the pre-vaporization process, because that's going to be different for the biodiesel because it's got a higher boiling point. We focus on the flame structure. We focus on where the heat is released in the combustion chamber. We focus on what the flame speed is. We focus on, because we're running lean, we have to worry about where things are going to blow out. And we focus on the pollutant formation. The pictures down in the bottom are, are computational fluid dynamic calculations that we've made of a, of a combustion chamber, a gas turbine combustion chamber. The middle picture is the temperature field. The red is about 1,800 degrees Kelvin. The, the bottom picture is the oxide of nitrogen formation map that we calculate for that temperature field. And so we will be doing that 
for these liquid fuels and to see how they compare, how the biodiesel in this kind of situation compares with the diesel. So the conclusions. If it's ethanol that's, that's going to be mainly produced, no problem. I don't see a lot of combustion challenge in that. It's pretty easy to use. Or if it's methanol, I don't see a huge amount of combustion challenge. But if it's a biodiesel or something like that, or this new stuff called, called biojet, then if you burn it as a traditional spray combustion, yellow flame combustion, there's going to have to be significant work done on, on the fuel spray, on the, on the injectors, on the nozzles, the atomizers. For land-based combustion systems, for that type of fuel, the way to go, I think, is lean premix combustion because that offers the opportunity for your, for your biofuel to be cleaner and maybe significantly cleaner than your, than your uh, petroleum fuel. And then the interesting possibility is to have on-site conversion, essentially gasification, of the, of the bio-liquid fuel into a gas, which then you burn that in the, in the, in the engine or in the furnace. And, and, that, and, that, and that conversion unit, if there was any sodium or potassium in the fuel, that could drop out right there and not go into the engine. Thank you very much.